Well, hello there, Space Monkeys. Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden. We're going to be reading more of Dreamland by Sam Quinones today. Uh, it's going to be chapter 14, I believe. And I'm going back to the library tomorrow or the next day. I go every three months or so as they recycle the books in their bookstore. So let me know if there's anything you want me to get for future seasons. I'm open to anything. Anything you guys leave in the comments, I read, look up the book. And if it sounds interesting, I always look for it. Uh, so I have a list. Just let me know. I'm not going to go buy anything new. don't have the money, but if you guys leave me something, I'll keep an eye out. And if it shows up, we'll read it. So I have some pretty cool ones I'll bring up at the end of this, uh, not this episode, the end of this book for options for the next one. I found a couple of really good ones uh, two months ago or so. So this is page 76, and we'll probably just do one chapter today and one chapter tomorrow. This chapter is Searching for the Holy Grail, Lexington, Kentucky. On New Year's Day 2013, I steered a rental car through the snow-covered rolling hills just north of Lexington. The land there is divided into horse farms, and black four-board fencing provides simple and clear outlines for these pastures. As my car loped hypnotically past these farms and trees laden with mistletoe, I came to a lonely two-lane county road known as CR 70, 1977. CR 1977 rises over small hills, curves, and then deflates as the hills bottom out. The road cuts past a farm to the north, home to a dozen studs, stallions, and broodmares. It passes the Masterson Equestrian Facility, a large park for horses. Then it bends and reveals a collection of stern, tall brick buildings set well back from the road. The compound could pass for a 19th century factory were it not for the towering stadium lights that clarify the situation. The Federal Medical Center, as it's now known, is home to the 17th, 1700 prison inmates. I got out of my car. Prison officials had denied my request to see its innards, so 150 yards was as close as I was getting to one of the strangest monuments in the story of American opiate addiction. When it went up in 1935, this federal fortress was known as the Narcotic Farm. The Roosevelt administration deemed it a, quote, new deal for the drug addict. Under the Harrison Act of 1914, Thousands of addicts were convicted as criminals and streamed into prisons, where their drug-seeking disrupted life in the institutions. The government built the narcotic farm to house them. It was a rare place, both a prison and a treatment center, that for 40 years reflected the country's schizophrenic approach to opiates and drug addiction. During years, during years when much of the country was segregated, blacks and whites, gays and straights, Latinos, Italians, Irish, Chinese, men and women from across America shared a thousand acres in Kentucky with only heroin in common. Many were serving prison sentences. Others, like beat writer William Burroughs, checked themselves in to kick the habit. The farm stressed outdoor work as addiction therapy. Inmates milked cows and raised tomatoes and wheat and supplied the institution with food. There was a canning plant, a radio repair service, and a dental lab making false teeth. Administrators felt recreation was therapy. Addicts played basketball and tennis. The farm had a golf course, a bowling alley, and basket weaving classes. In the 1940s, off in New York City, Charlie Parker turned swing jazz inside out. Hundreds of younger New York musicians worshipped the alto saxophonist and turned to heroin hoping to play more like Bird who died addicted in 1955, his body and his art corroded by junk. Many of these musicians went to prison. A virtual generation of Bebop's young punks and dark glasses came to the farm. Sonny Rollins, Lee Morgan, Howard McGee, Elvin Jones, Chet Baker, Tad Dameron, Jackie McLean, Sonny Stitt, and many more. They jammed for hours, formed bands that were never recorded, and played shows for the farm's inmate, inmates and Lexington hipsters who were allowed to attend. A farm jazz band once played The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. I encountered the story of the narcotic farm as I sought to understand how, decades later, a Mexican village came to sell heroin across the country and in places where the drug had once been virtually unknown. The threads of these stories that I came to believe ultimately connected. For years, the farm was the world's foremost center of addiction research for reasons that predated the institution itself. World War I had again demonstrated to doctors the merciful painkilling benefits the morphine molecule provided. Fresh, too, in their memory were heroin's first decades, which showed just as clearly that addiction too often bedeviled those who used opiates. Try as they might, 
with strategies as varied as farm work, group therapy, or prison, rehabilitation specialists never graduated much more than 10% of their addicts to true opiate freedom. The rest relapsed slaves, as it appeared, to the morphine molecule. This seemed a shame to scientists and physicians. Was mankind really doomed and did not have it all? Couldn't it have heaven without hell? Couldn't the best scientists find a way of extracting the painkilling attributes from the molecule while discarding its miserable addictiveness? In 1928, what would become known as the Committee on Problems of Drug Dependence, or the CPDD, brought together the country's best researchers to do just that. John D. Rockefeller Jr. organized it using money his father had set aside. The CPDD promoted cooperation among drug researchers in government, academia, and industry. German science used this kind of collaboration to come up with some of the world's best drugs. But German drug supplies to America ceased during World War I. After the war, American scientists concluded that the country was vulnerable because U.S. drug research was random and haphazard. The CPDD funded chemists and pharmacologists, academics and industrial scientists, towards the goal of finding a non-addictive painkiller. Novocaine, invented in 1905, avoided the need for addictive cocaine in dentistry. Why'd they have to go and do that? Dentistry was more fun when there was cocaine involved, right? Just, just kidding. Why not a morphine substitute? Such a drug could cleanse doctors' image as clueless dealers of dangerous drugs that they'd earned by widely prescribing heroin in the 1900s. Academics, meanwhile, hoped for a new era of modern scientific research applied to medicinal drugs. Law enforcement hoped a non-addictive pain reliever would lessen the fallout from its attempts to rid the country of opium. Researchers called this drug the Holy Grail, and the search for it would take the rest of the century and beyond. The CPDD set up a laboratory at the University of Virginia to create these new drugs. Another lab formed at the University of Michigan to test new drugs on animals. Now, all that was needed was a place to test new drugs on humans, a place where drug addicts were in ready and huge supply. In 1935, the U.S. narcotic farm opened. The farm contained a, a section known as the Addiction Research Center, or ARC. For decades, the ARC tested on inmates every major opiate that committee-sponsored chemists produced. Dilaudid, Demerol, Darvin, Codeine, as well as Thorazine, and many tranquilizers and sedatives. Experiments at the farm showed that methadone lasted longer and spared junkies the severe highs and lows of heroin that spurred their frenzied attempts to score. Thus, they concluded methadone could act as a replacement for heroin. The ARC had a staff of psychiatrists, biochemists, physiologists, pharmacologists, lab techs, and four guards. They studied every aspect of morphine's interaction with man. ARC research developed the first quantitative scales for measuring degrees of addiction, severity of withdrawal, and the addictiveness of many drugs. For four decades, heroin and morphine addicts with long sentences would volunteer for studies because they were given dope. After the studies ended, the subjects were given a six-month rehab to ensure that they would no longer be physically dependent. As American science organized to search for the holy grail of a non-addictive painkiller, the farm made this research possible and kept hope alive. Researchers viewed their mission simply, to prevent another heroin, prevent another highly addictive drug unleashed on the country without proper study. With this, they justified experimentation on inmates, quote, the ARC saw itself as safeguarding the public health on a global scale by preventing addictive compounds from destroying the lives of thousands, wrote Nancy Campbell, J.P. Olson, and Luke Walden in The Narcotic Farm, a fascinating book on the institution. I will be keeping my eye out for that book as well, The Narcotic Farm. Sounds interesting. The research at Lexington generated hundreds of scholarly articles and amounted to the only serious study of addiction in the world at the time. The WHO relied on it for data. Addiction study emerged there as a scientific field, and ARC staff were the first to conceive of addiction as not a character failing or a crime, but rather a chronic brain disorder. The ARC was shut down in the 70s, when the U.S. Senate's church committee investigating the CIA found that the ARC had done experiments with LSD on inmates at the behest of the CIA, which... If you know anything about the CIA, that's called um, like a normal Tuesday. 
uh, that's also called MK Ultra. Read up on that. It's fascinating. If you find any books on that, we're going to read up on that too. With that, the era ended. The farm was transformed into the prison and the hospital that it is today. But for 40 years, all the drugs created in the CPDD's search for the Holy Grail were tested on inmates at the narcotic farm in Lexington, Kentucky. Early on, the UVA laboratory's first director, Lyndon Small, synthesized a drug he called Metapon. Metapon had some of morphine's painkilling attributes, but was slightly less addictive. Metapon fell short of the idea the CPP, CPDD pursued. It, yet it was taken as proof that a morphine-like painkiller that was not addictive, that elusive holy grail, might be found someday. This goal urged on the next generation's of drug researchers, and in time helped fire a cadre of revolutionaries seeking a better way to treat pain in America. The next chapter is called The Pain. That'll be page 80. We'll get that done tomorrow or the next day, I assure you, unless something catastrophic happens to me, which I have no plans to do anything like that, so hopefully tomorrow. Keep fighting that good fight out there, guys. I'll talk to you later.